It was the challenge many thought impossible, a circumnavigation of the British Isles in ribs, rigid inflatable boats, only four metres in length. Heavy seas would test human endurance to the limit, engine failure would cause frustrations for some, and others would be forced to abandon their boats in despair. Ten days have been set aside to complete the challenge, with Plymouth acting as the start and finish point. The ribs will begin their clockwise circumnavigation around Land's End and up to Milford Haven. From there they head north into the Irish Sea, calling at Port St Mary on the Isle of Man, before setting off on one of the longest legs, 230 miles through the Inner Hebrides to the Kyle of Lochouch. The most northerly port of call will be Scrabster in the Pentland Firth, before the teams push on south to Berwick-upon-Tweed. The next scheduled stops are Wells next the sea in Norfolk, followed by Ramsgate and Southampton, before returning to Plymouth. Only one day has been set aside in the schedule as a weather-covered day. With the Round Britain Challenge four months away, event organiser Hugo Montgomery Swan has been making reconnaissance trips to all the ports of call. Hugo's a devoted ribster who, from his offices near Honiton, runs the only magazine dedicated to these 4x4s of the sea. It's taken six months to put together the challenge, which is known as RB4. The RB4 challenge is quite unique in the sense that although um, Britain has been circumnavigated uh, many times in different, different boats, um, as far as power boats are concerned, it's never been circumnavigated in anything so small as a four metre, a four metre power boat. Uh, we are screening the applicants very, very carefully to, to make sure that those who are going to be entering the challenge know what they're in for and have done similar things in the past. Therefore, they're going to be expecting a rough time of it. I name this boat, or this rib, Gem. It's the first launch of Gem, the only hand-built rib to be entered, crewed by John Aldis and Wayne Johnson. It was important to the team to have a boat with a proven hull design, and Gem began life as a speedboat. Under the guidance of designer Simon Sanderson, her hull was removed, and she was fitted out with an inflatable collar, centre console steering, and a 50 horsepower outboard engine. The team have been burning the midnight oil in readiness for the challenge. John, a former Marine commando, has worked with ribs in the past and has great faith in their sea-keeping qualities and rugged design. They're very confident in inspiring boats. I mean, I've technically sunk them a few times just mucking about and circle mucking about and sometimes working in them. And actually, you know, they'd be technically sunk, but they save you every time. When, when you sort of like, um, when you get these sort of experiences of a boat, you believe in them. I mean, they are... You'd have, to get a, you'd have to get an elephant to sit on a sort of seven metre boat to actually push the tubes under the water. I mean, they're so buoyant. They're inherently buoyant. They're um, robust. They're, like, they're the four-wheel drive of the sea. I mean, that's what they call it, and they are. The sea it can be a very scary place. You don't know what you're going to be up against. It's, you know, you, you, you wake up in the morning and you have no idea what, what, what you're going to get the next, you know, by the end of the night. I mean... That is the exciting thing about it. You're dealing with the unknown. You're dealing with forces which are way above you, and it's just, and it, and it's like whatever comes. Exactly, and it's the exciting thing is not knowing what you're going to yeah. get. It's the beginning of summer, and Sulcombe is bracing itself for the start of the tourist season. Lifeboatman Mark Featherstone will be entering the challenge with his boat, Spirit. The boat itself is only 4.8 meters long which to uh, most people is 15 feet. So it's a very, very small boat to circumnavigate uh, the British Isles. But uh, it's very simple in its construction. It's got a fiberglass solid hull. It's got a sponson or a tube collar which runs right the way along the hull, which is actually just glued on. That's all it is, is adhesive that glues the two together. You've got a fiberglass steering position and seating position, outboard engine on the back of the boat, fuel for the engine, 
radio communications, navigation, steering. And that is it in a nutshell. There's not an awful lot of boat, which to, to circumnavigate the British Isles, 1,800 miles, is going to be quite a challenge, I must admit. There's an awful lot of people who are sceptical. I am sceptical myself. I'm not sure whether this can be done or not. I think it's going to rely very much on, on the elements, on the weather. If we get the weather conditions, then the next obstacle is the mechanics of the boat, if you like, the engine, the hull, the tubes, all staying together. If we get a major failure, then that's going to stop the challenge. We've got everything that we need in place, but we're having a lot of problems gelling it all together. We've had a lot of problems with the engines at the moment, or the engine that we've got at the moment. Uh, I've got a lot of concern about that. Uh, d uh, th there is, there's a, a quick, we're relying very much on the equipment, and it's got to work on the day. We're going to be running for a lot of hours. We could be running in, in extreme conditions to the limit of the boat, uh, and any any weakness in those, uh, in those systems will be exploited and we're going to find out and we've got to be resourceful to be able to, to get this boat back up, back, up and, back up and running. The world of ribs is normally male dominated but joining Team Gemini will be Maritime Studies graduate Cassie Richardson, the only female entrant. Are there, are there any sort of logistical um, problems that you might, you might be being the only woman? Um, yeah, going for a pee, I think that's going to be a big problem actually, <laughs> I think that, that is the one issue I have had to sit back and think, right, how am I going to do this? Um, men, it's so easy for men, uh, as we all do, but in a dry suit for a woman, it's going to be at least a half an hour operation, uh, about half a mile away from the rest of the fleet, so I can have a little bit of privacy, <laughs> that's going to be the biggest problem I think. But um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll sit and discuss that with the boys first and we come up with some sort of amicable plan. <laughs> I'm going to peeve the back of the boat. <laughs> so that's going to be quite fun. I don't know. I've always been inspired to go and just see if I can push myself to a limit or to experience new challenges, really, new experiences. I was inspired really to do the Round Britain when I heard my friend Andy talk about it at university. I always thought, oh, you're jamming, but I really want to go and do that as well. Um, and uh, it's just because I, I really I know um, a fair bit about ribs. I've got experience with ribs, but what inspired me the most was just to see whether these poor little ribs could actually handle it. <laughs> I mean, I knew I could. I knew I, I, I would be able to do the challenge. Um, but I just wanted to know what the actual extent of these boats and what they could handle, and see if um, if they could be pushed to their limits. So, and, and just to say I've done it really, it's just something I can turn around and say to show off to my friends with. <laughs> It's the eve of the Round Britain Challenge and Plymouth's Mountbatten Centre is hosting the city's Maritime Festival. It's an upbeat atmosphere, but not for everyone. All boats must be thoroughly inspected by the safety committee before they can take part and it's now time for Team Aldis to face the scrutineer. For John and Wayne, it's the culmination of many months hard work and sleepless nights. So, I mean, we've been working on this like non-stop, day in, day out since January and for the last month there's been sort of well, five hours sleep a night type of thing just to get it done. It's really, you know, it's been right down to the wire just to get, you know, get it ready for this date. But yes, it was just designed for this in mind. A bit DIY, but everything seems to be nice and, um, and I, I, think, I think it's going to work well. Yeah, the boat cost me my relationship in five and a half years. Yeah, see, I was, well, I can't say what went wrong except I don't think I was giving, I was giving too much attention to the boat, basically. So yeah, I'm single. Uh, <laughs> any available girl. Right, it's just flares, wasn't it? Flares. Uh, you're, you're married, Wayne. I'm married. What, yeah. What does your wife think about your your 
involvement with that. Uh, she doesn't mind, but I haven't been spending too much time at home lately. She's got a very good mess. <laughs> I have got a very understanding wife, which is lucky. She lets me play with these toys in life. As darkness looms, it's time to launch and make any last minute adjustments to boats and equipment. With the start only 15 hours away, the weather's calm and everything seems perfect. The next day sees an approaching southwesterly gale sweeping up the English Channel towards Plymouth. With the schedule only allowing one day's weather cover, the decision to stay or go now hangs in the balance. Good morning everybody, and well done for, for getting here. Half the battle is just being here today, isn't it? Um, we have a, a fun day's boating ahead of us with um, some lively conditions. Essentially we want to run as a flotilla today. Stay together as a flotilla. It's a team event, it's not a race. And maybe for some of the people that aren't quite as experienced as maybe others are, it'd be quite nice moralistically if we all sort of stick together for the first day, but I can't decide that for you. Once you get out in the water, you, you know, it's up to yourselves, but personally I'd recommend, for, certainly for the first day, to get all your teething problems, get a bit of morale boosted, stay together. They decide to go for it, but the teams are apprehensive, aware of how vulnerable these boats can be in large head seas. The first few hours could be the most difficult as the boats encounter the confused seas around the Lizard. Once round Land's End though, conditions should ease for the final push up the Bristol Channel towards Milford Haven. But with 180 miles ahead of them, it's not going to be easy. Things are not looking good for Mark's boat, Spirit, which is still having engine problems. How do you feel about the weather conditions today, Mark? It looks... I don't like them at all. I don't like it at all. Uh, in one of these positions where you, you, you're, you wouldn't normally attempt something like this, but we're going, we're going to run as a flotilla, safety in numbers. The other option is just not to go. And uh, I don't feel that's an option at the moment, after all the work we've put in it. We've had a lot of problems with the engine. It's spiked all the electronics. Uh, so we've effectively had to buy all new electronics. And the, hopefully our Garmin GPS has just arrived now. So we'll be able to, we'll be able to use that. Under the spotlight of local television crews, organiser Hugo prepares to set off. Joining him will be his 12-year-old son Thomas, the youngest person to have attempted a round Britain circumnavigation in such a small boat. High winds and big seas predicted. Yep. How, how are you looking forward to that? Um, well, I've been out in conditions, we're, we're quite hairy conditions before, uh, but I trust my co-pilot, we'll be alright. Uh, I'm, I'm anxious, but it's, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. It's just a challenge, yeah. Pull us up on the Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't mind too much about the, the heavy seas, because I know, I know what the boat's like and I know it can handle it. Accompanying Cassie will be Team Gemini skipper Jan Falkowski, the most experienced ribster entering the event. Yeah, I've done the Atlantic twice. We did it um, four weeks ago in Alan Priddy's boat, we're at Cardiff. We set a new world record um, for the fastest powerboat crossing. And then we did the Atlantic in a 7.5 metre river in 97. And we did a London Monte Carlo in 98 and set a record. So I've done quite a few long trips, but not normally invited to this size. It'll be quite a challenge, actually, and a bit more exciting. Yeah. And it's somewhere starting with a rough forecast yeah. first day for quite good terms would be a good shakedown to get everything sorted out and uh, running smoothly. <laughs> Many wonder whether the fleet will make it back in just 10 days and for Team Rivex skipper Steve Harvey it's vital that the weather doesn't delay them for too long. If we get back on time then uh, later that week I'll get married all being well. Um, so I, we get back on the Sunday and I get married on the Saturday following that, six days later, so very busy, but uh, more incentive to get round, I think. Yeah. And what does your fiancé think about this? She, she loves it. She, um, she, she doesn't worry too much, which is good, but um, she knows that we put safety first, uh, but she's excited that, that, that we're doing it and that uh, um, it's going to be a great experience and a great, a great event to have participated in. Good morning. 
Oh, everything's the last minute rush again, as this whole project's been, but we're there, we're in the water. Well, I bet you're glad that we're actually going. I am glad, yeah. It's been a long time coming. Okay, I've got to board my vessel. With only moments left before the start, all boats now take to the water. The smallest boat entering the challenge is Team Seal, crewed by father and son Harry and Howard Shepherd. At 11am, all boats wait in readiness for the signal from the starting cannon. And after months of preparation, they're finally off. With the southwesterly Force 5 conditions worse than expected, everyone prepares themselves for a rough ride. It's heavy going for the small boats in such large head seas. And even the bigger support boats have problems. Yes Deer is a rib twice the size of most boats and is also doubling as the camera boat. But less than an hour out of Plymouth, Yes Deer is forced to watch the fleet push on ahead when her engine fails. The only hope of remaining in the challenge lies with onboard mechanic Phil Ward, nicknamed Spanner, who attempts to fix the problem. <laughs> The rest of the RB4 fleet encounter heavy seas and poor visibility as they attempt to round the Lizard into Mounts Bay. But as the hours pass, the weather improves. By 6pm the camera boat catches up with ribs at the rear of the fleet. Bangor Challenger, the only Irish entry, is crewed by sailing and powerboat instructors Alan McEwan and Hugh Holmes. And an hour later Mark's boat Team Spirit catches up. A broken fuel line forced the team to start an hour behind the rest of the fleet. It's a lively sea, but conditions are improving, and the sun lifts everyone's spirits as the boat makes a steady 25 knots. Having rounded Land's End, they're now slowly gaining on the RB4 fleet ahead. But then, disaster strikes. Spirit lies dead in the water, unable to continue under its own power. The saddle bracket, securing the engine to the boat, has failed after hours of punishment in the choppy seas. Cyanide, their support boat, is on hand, but it looks like Spirit will have to be towed into Milford Haven, which is 45 nautical miles away. All Mark and Martin, his teammate, can do is secure a tow line and sit the rest of the journey out aboard Cyanide. It's a bitter disappointment for both of them, who are now forced to abandon Spirit. The maximum towing speed will be 12 knots, which means their ETA in Milford Haven will now be 3 a.m. And for Mark and Martin, it appears as though their challenge has come to an end. The first day has been a gruelling one, with only six out of the nine boats making it to South Wales. It's a terrible blow for Alan and Hugh. With insufficient petrol to get them all the way to Milford Haven, they're forced back to Newlyn to refuel. John and Wayne aboard Gem make it to North Devon where they aim to set off early tomorrow morning to rejoin the rest of the boats. But there's a sad end to Team Seal's challenge. With their engine swamped 20 miles southwest of Plymouth, Harry and Howard are forced to abandon their challenge and are towed back to Plymouth.
It's day two, and a late 11.30am start for the teams as they run out of Milford Haven. The ribs are soon faced with large steep head seas that require skilful reading of the waves by the helmsman, together with careful use of the throttle to prevent the boats from launching into the air. Waves 15 to 20 feet high present problems even for the larger support boats. But once round the headland, the conditions ease for the RB4 fleet, now able to cruise at a steady 18 knots, helped by a large following sea. Today's leg will be around 160 nautical miles, taking them round St David's Head and up through the Irish Sea, passing North Wales and the Isle of Anglesey, and up to Port St Mary on the Isle of Man, a small fishing port located on the south of the island. Bright sunshine and calm seas, the second leg passes without incident as the crews settle down to a nine hour passage. As the sun begins to set, the flotilla catch the first sight of the Isle of Man. Upon entering the port, the teams wait to be guided to the moorings. Some ribs will require minor work before setting off tomorrow on one of the longest and most gruelling legs of the challenge. It's a bright start with a good weather forecast of light winds and calm seas. For many, last night was the first chance of a good night's sleep, but the punishing first day has left its mark on a few of the entrants. Have you got any aches anywhere? At my arms. I feel like I've been in the gym for the last 24 hours. My arms are completely pumped up. My bottom of my back, I think I've fused about three vertebrae together. Um, but, I don't know. It's uh, general ache. My head hurts. <laughs> As some of the new engines have their first service, there's dramatic news that Hugo has been called back to Devon. Hugo had to return home for his wife, so we're uh, not feeling too well at the moment. So, uh, yeah, it back and I've hopped in the boat with his son because uh, he's very keen for Thomas to go all the way around. And, um, yeah, looks like we're going to be doing the same thing tomorrow and hopefully he's going to be joining us uh, a bit later, later on, hopefully in the north of Scotland. In Hugo's absence, Jan, Team Gemini skipper, agrees to take on overall responsibility for coordinating the teams. However, many of the boats are having their own mechanical teething problems, so hopes of an early morning start are fading fast. So Jan, about the other boats here, we're just tightening up a few bits of pieces, just routines and running maintenance, but uh, forecast the best today, it's two to three, so run up to car lockout should be quite good. So looking forward to it. Okay. One of the boats is over in Pony, so it's leaving now to catch up with us, so hopefully there'll be five boats leaving here, plus one of the safety boats. So in Kyle for about nine tonight with any luck. Trim it tight, put it right, trim it right in, keep it tight so it's less stress on the engine mounts and everything. Keep it trimmed right in and we'll just drive it to it. Baby, you hear that Ralph? We're pretty much on schedule still, but um, we're now just at the point where we need to make some good repairs and, and um, some of the boats need a little bit of work on them to get them going. Not major work, but just enough to keep us going. Are you surprised at how many boats we lost in the first day? No. Um, not really. I mean, the, the conditions were very tough, and if we were going to lose boats, then it would have been on that first day. It was a long leg. Um, but uh, they're always going to be dropouts, just be just because the the pounding that the boats take. Um, but we're pleased to still have the five, and uh, it's a good flotilla, and, and we're all working well together. It's a good team spirit, and, and we're all staying very close together. So it's good. 
it's good as long as we um, as long as we can get these little repairs done all still on all still very much all systems go and uh, be back in time for a wedding <laughs> Again, it's another late 11 o'clock start as the boats launch, but the sun's shining and everyone's in good spirits. Things seem to be going well as the boats head north up towards the Mull of Kintyre at a steady 20 knots. But it doesn't last for long. After three hours, the flotilla come to a halt as Team Ribex encounters a problem with its engine's automated shutdown system. We're going along fine, it sounds great. Um, and then a, a warning light is coming on on the console, uh, sorry, a warning beep. And as that comes on, an override system comes in and um, effectively shuts the engine down. Um, normally the beeps only happen for uh, cooling or oil, both of which are fine. Um, so it could be a problem with the, the warning system itself, cutting the engine down when there isn't actually a problem. Um, so we don't know. We don't know. It's not a lot we can do at the moment. They decide to bypass the system by disconnecting the sensors, hoping nothing more serious occurs. flotilla push on into Scotland through the Sound of Jura. In good weather this is one of the most picturesque parts of the British coastline but conditions here are unpredictable and can deteriorate rapidly in a matter of minutes. Sure enough, it doesn't take long before the rain comes down and the cold begins to set in. There's an unscheduled stop when 12-year-old Tom runs over a lobster pot. It may be a little embarrassing for Tom, but it does provide a moment of light relief for the others. <laughs> Steve and Andy are on hand to help out have to take a dip in the cold waters to free the snarl propeller before the boats can continue through the sound of Islay towards Oban. It's now 10pm and the light's fading. With another 50 miles to go, the boats pull into a diving centre to refuel. The teams now have to decide whether to overnight here in Oban or keep going in order to rendezvous with the land support teams at the Kyle of Lochalsh. It's a difficult call, but they decide to push on into the darkness. Five hours later, and it's 3.30 a.m. when the teams finally get in. There's hot tea and sandwiches, but no one's in the mood for conversation. Exhausted, everyone knows that in five hours it'll be time to set off again. With the Isle of Skye shrouded in mist, it's a calm, peaceful start to day four, although stronger southwesterly winds are forecast later on. Last night, the teams only managed four hours sleep, but everyone seems to be in good humour. Well, I'm not one for hats, but when I do have hats, I go big star. <laughs> this, is the man, this is the man that says he doesn't do caps. <laughs> it was an uncomfortable night for Tom, who suffered from the cold, wet conditions. But Cassie's on hand for a bit of moral support. A quick breather. Brent, good lad. We like to see 
there that you're looking forward to today? Yes, I am. It's going to be really pretty. Hopefully, we can see something. Okay. <laughs> we drove around the best parts of the whole uh, course yesterday and missed it all because of the fog. Charming. But no, it'll be lovely. Today should be really nice. You got any aches and pains? Um, I, I've lost my, my, my pains. Have you? Has it just gone totally numb or, or yeah. they, they, yeah. they didn't hurt anyone? <laughs> my back's gone numb. <laughs> yeah, my back's hurt a little bit. I'm just aching all over generally, nothing too bad. 15-year-old George Harvey is also taking part in the challenge aboard Black Max, which last night caught up with the main flotilla. Rejoining the challenge today is the Irish entry Banger Challenger, who have news of the whereabouts of Mark's boat, Spirit. We've just heard that Spirit are, are out of it, and with their, their uh, support boat, uh, Cyanide, they're actually parked next to uh, the skipper's yacht in our own home marina in Bangor in Northern Ireland. Well, our spears are in Bangor, where we come from, and, all, and we're up here without them, because they were carrying our spears. So we, we hope we don't need them now. So. Yeah. It's sort of, it's a young guy's game, this, and we're old guys. <laughs> so we're sort of, yeah, we think we're sticking it pretty well. Yeah. Sort of lack of food, that will do our size and diet, you know, do us no harm at all, but well, we'll see how it goes. It'd be nice to get in somewhere in time to actually buy some hot food for a change rather than surviving on sandwiches and crisps. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a bit different to you racing a yacht. Yeah. Marine engineers have been working through the night to get the boats ready for today's run which will take the teams to Scrabster. It'll also take them around Cape Roth, a headland feared by all that know it for its huge seas and strong tidal conditions. So the run to Cape Roth is about 85 miles, so I reckon four to five hours will get us there without too much trouble. At 11.50 a.m. they set off on their 160 mile leg, hoping they can reach Scrabster before the predicted southwesterly winds move in. Six ribs, together with the support boat Yes Dear, approach Cape Roth as the conditions deteriorate. It's a hostile place, with sheer cliff faces and no beaches or harbours to pull into for shelter. Tides and wave formations can be unpredictable. But today, Cape Roth's in a benign mood. As the ribs pass the headland, they decide to go round together as a team. The boats head east towards Scrabster, thankful of the calm seas. Having turned east, the teams overnight in the small fishing port of Scrabster on the north coast then set off early the next day on another 230 mile leg, past John O'Groats, through the Pentland Firth, passing Peterhead, then across the Firth of Forth to Berwick-upon-Tweed. It's a gloomy, wet, miserable day as the boats pass John O'Groats. 
The only consolation is the abundant populations of guillemots who leave their clifftop nests to take a look at their strange visitors. Afternoon brings the first rays of sunshine as the ribs make their way southeast, but it's going to be a long trip with conditions expected to worsen as the day draws on. As the sun begins to set, the crews are faced with the thought that there's still 60 more miles to go. Conditions deteriorate fast, with the oncoming waves growing steadily stronger, forcing the boats to slow down to 10 or 12 knots. For hours the ribs take a pounding, the skippers begin to worry about gear failure. The first casualty of the evening is Cassie. A momentary lapse of concentration has resulted in a collision with the steering console. Cassie suffers a bloodied nose, but she's lucky it's not something more serious. The teams continue, but it's not easy keeping together and there are concerns for Alan and Hugh aboard Banger Challenger who've fallen behind and lost contact with the main group. The situation's hampered by further problems with Team Ribex's engine. All the other ribs can do is wait while support boat mechanic Spanner jumps on board to take a look. This continual stopping and starting is beginning to cause frustrations with some skippers and dashes all hopes of reaching their destination before midnight. Time. With Banger Challenger now having caught up, the flotilla make their final push towards Berwick. As darkness sets in, many begin to wonder whether this leg is ever going to end. Travelling in the moonlight, the boats finally reach Berwick-upon-Tweed at 1.30am. Day 6 of the challenge sees a misty start, with the weary teams facing the prospect of another long passage to Wells Next the Sea. Yesterday, Steve? Right. <laughs> um, no, it was miserable. Absolutely miserable. Hated it. Hate ribs. Hate the sea. Never stepping on a boat again. After we finish. Um, no, it was it was um, just what these boats don't like. Right on the nose. Dark. It's cold. It was wet and it just went on and on and on. But um, I think that's part of it. It's part of the challenge, really. So pleased to have done it, but I think today is going to be just as miserable because the wind's picked up and it's right on the beam. So mm. didn't didn't enjoy it too much. It's times like that that um, you have to remember that I suppose it's a mental challenge as much as a physical challenge. We sit there and you think, why am I here? Why am I doing it? And we're doing it because of how you feel when you've done it, not how you feel while you're doing it. I suppose, and it will be over soon. <laughs> it will be over and then we can all uh, burn our ribs in a big pile in the middle of, uh, in the middle of Devon somewhere. Um, my friend here will, will join us for that. We'll come over for the bonfire. <laughs> exactly, he'll come, yeah. he'll come over especially for the bonfire and we'll just have uh, one great big bonfire and we'll call it the uh, 
festival of Ribex or something. <laughs> <laughs> Where all boats will be piled up. Largest one at the bottom, smallest one at the top. And the engine in the middle. On the, yeah, we'll sing a song, and after three, we'll all chuck a match in together. <laughs> and the whole run. thing <laughs> and run. Right. And the whole thing will go up and smoke. No, but I'm sure I'm sure there'll be such a buzz when we actually do pull in. Such a buzz. Can't really feel it at the moment. <laughs> no. It's, but the, uh, the, the spirit's still fairly good, I think. The yeah. body's weak, but the spirit's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How was yeah. the ride in your in your Humber? You you looked to be uh, sort of bouncing around. Uh, we were getting thrown around quite a bit. It was uh, it was not easy. It was it was it was it was it was a rough go, especially for a couple oh, yeah. of right. couple of boys our age, you know. So we're. Um, we're there, we're still doing it, uh, just about. Once the dark came, it, it got sort of harder. Uh, you weren't seeing what was coming at you. And it was just, you know, everything concentration goes, your whole sort of mindset gets twisted a bit. You know, you think you see things and you know, you're looking for lights on the horizon. You know, you, all you want to do is see land, you just want to get in off that water. You know? And the, the, the agony of when, when you actually, you're powering along and you see some lights and you think, oh, we must be nearly getting there. <clears throat> and then you realise, no, that's not the lights we're looking for. And you, you, you have to veer away from the lights into complete darkness again to look for some more lights that you can't see yet. It takes a lot of willpower. It takes a lot of willpower. But it's so true. Last night when we came off, the... the um, as you looked at the floor, for some reason, it was it was for, it was like wave forming. It was a ripple, and for hours after we got in last night, even the ceiling, as you looked at it, your eyes played tricks on you. You mean you had, you looked at the, my head at the pillow and it went boom, <laughs> gone? No, I looked at the ceiling briefly. I don't know what it is, it, but you do your mind does start to play little tricks on you. It was, um, it's the worst kind of sea condition you can get on the beam and in the dark, but uh, we survived, and we're here, ready to fight another day. How's your body coping with it all? Reasonably well. <laughs> um, my back hurts quite a lot, um, and I've got, uh, I've got throttle wrist, um, which, which, <laughs> which is, isn't very pleasant. <laughs> That doesn't come from throttling, that comes from um, nighttime activity. Console knee and lip. And don't mention rubber bottom. Cassie, <laughs> 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 no. I heard you had an accident yesterday. It wasn't an accident, just lack of concentration for a second. <laughs> Yeah, I, was too was I was too busy singing, <laughs> very loudly, and um, I just hit my head. I've got a bit of a bloody nose, but it's fine. It's all every day in the course of events. <laughs> yeah, and I speak. I've got a swollen nose because I hit it twice now, and it's swelling up more and more. It's quite sore, so I'm a little bit worried, but not too bad to go with that bump there. So I'll just see what happens today. Probably come out of the back eye or cut lip. <laughs> Hugo now rejoins the challenge after leaving due to a family medical emergency. I got a call from Michaela, my wife, and, and she was very worried that she might have a blood clot, clot in her leg, which is all a bit uh, dramatic and worrying. And um, so I dashed back uh, from Milford, back home, got her to see several consultants, and they did numerous checks. And, and her her leg is is um, is okay to the extent that there are no horrible problems. So so that's all right. It's a big relief. And now back in the back in the fray, as it were. Where are we? Are we on the, on this map even? Hugo's reappearance brings a much needed morale boost to the teams. Now able to look at today's daunting 230 mile trip with a little more humour. So if we can negotiate the top flask and head down towards the southerly flask. Mm. Yeah. Keep the oxtail well to port. <laughs> Um, and get a, a get a good bearing off the Litchfield's pasteurised milk. <laughs> Excellent. I think we can manage that, all right. <laughs> if we arrive, though, to well. With the one weather cover day available in the schedule, there's the possibility of splitting today's trip into two short legs, with the option of overnighting at Whitby. We won't get to Whitby till I reckon about three three thirty this afternoon, which will be a good time to call a shout, depending on how people are, how the boats are, and how people are feeling. 
as the teams prepare to set off, further engine problems tip the balance in favour of overnighting in Whitby. Who needs accommodation for tonight in Whitby? Hands up. Everyone. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> okay. As Joe, the land support coordinator, dashes off by road to secure moorings and accommodation for the teams, the boats set off on what will now be a more leisurely 120 mile run to Whitby on the Yorkshire coast. Thick sea mist always presents challenges for small, fast moving craft, but the rain helps to flatten the surface of the water, ensuring a speedy passage. It's not long, however, before the sun begins to burn through and suddenly everyone seems revitalised. Today's short leg has been a godsend for everyone, especially teams Jem and Spirit who've been running a day behind trying to catch up with the main flotilla. It's late afternoon and conditions are idyllic as the RB4 teams arrive at the visitors' pontoons. From the blues this morning, the sort of the sunburn this afternoon, it really was uh, an awful lot better. It just makes you feel a bit better. It's just like anything, you know, you get a bit of sunlight and you feel good. So. Here we are, sunny Whitby. We're going to go out tonight and look for Dracula. Uh, see if we can find him. But it's, you know, well, if we can't find him, we'll just eat the steak. Um, <laughs> With everyone thinking they'd dropped out, it's great to see Mark's boat, Spirit, finally catch up. <laughs> Arriving with a new engine, the team's determination and ingenuity have finally paid off. They're now back in the challenge with the rest of the RB4 ribs. I thought we were done for, tell you the truth. I didn't think we were going to, you know, even make the first, uh, the first uh, course really. And it was very, very. I think that's the lowest point of the whole trip because we'd spent two days fixing the engine prior to coming away. We were an hour late leaving. We caught up. Our ETA was 10:30, so we more or less had caught up with you and the saddle bracket went on the engine again, all over again. So we towed it, towed it in, and we managed to get a, an engine, new engine, first thing in the morning. It took a day to put on, and we set off first thing in the morning. So, and we've, uh, we've been trying to catch you. We didn't think we were going to catch you, because you've always been so far ahead. So uh, to, be, to, be running, to be running behind is so, so disheartening. We've just run hard, but what we're trying to do is try to to run so that we're not putting too much strain on on everybody and the and the machinery as well. Uh, that's the the main thing. In actual fact, when we came here, we eased off a little bit because we knew that we'd sort of caught up. So there was there was no point in uh, pushing it too much, really. You can't finish in Plymouth if your engine's broken. So I think what we'll be doing now is just trying to keep it down a little bit, just just a little bit off the edge, and. Uh, Hopefully, because there's a long way to go yet. Yeah. Well, that's all the boats back together, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah, we're really, we're really chuffed to get yeah. back in it. That's yeah. great. I yeah. think doing this stop was a good idea. Because the thing is, all the legs now between 100 and 120 miles, so they're all quite doable. Yeah. So by splitting today's legs into two short legs, mm. long legs now 130, which is. We can start to relax. Yeah. Mm. Well, the early nice. arrival in Whitby gives the teams the chance yeah. to swap stories yeah. and have a drink yeah. later in the evening. Hello. I'm very well. Mum, I bumped my face yesterday and I gave myself a bleeding nose. I did. I hit it on the metal bar on the seat in front of me and, um, and I cut my lip. A little, little cut. And I had a very bleeding nose. <laughs> but it's fine. I've got three bumps on my face now from the same place. <laughs> from hitting... No, it's not Andrew Hitting me actually. It's it's um it's a mixture of different drivers at the time. <laughs> it's, but but it's been it's really funny because you've had the thunderstorm down there and it's been absolutely flat calm here. Well, 
The last couple of days it has been lovely, absolutely lovely. Um, a fair bit of wind, but nothing. The water has actually been quite flat. I'm knackered. I am absolutely every morning because we've had about three, four hours sleep a night basically. Um, tonight's going to be a nice long sleep. Last night was quite long. Um, but we're in the pub at the moment, uh, we're just having the first sociable beer. As things seem to be picking up, news comes in that John and Wayne's challenge is over and they're now limping back to shore after vital bolts on their engines snapped. The shared highs and lows have created a good sense of camaraderie amongst the teams although one of the downsides is the effect that the sun, wind and seawater is having on people's faces. With the thought of wedding photographs in just over a week's time, Steve is getting a little concerned. Oh, my forehead feels like rubber. No, not rubber, leather. Makeup. <laughs> yeah, no, I look terrible. But um, it's got to be done, isn't it? It's all part of it, I suppose. Make it... You'll uh, recover from your uh, wedding. Yeah, well, I've got... I don't know, what vitamins are good for skin? Is it A or something? I'm going to be overdosing on it when I get back on Monday. Try and look half decent for some wedding photos on the following Saturday. Poor Debbie, my goodness, she's going to look at me and go, what on earth have you done? <laughs> there we go. Yes, exactly, to you. Not while he's looking like that, I'm afraid, she'll say. I'll break down, please. No. Yeah, that'll be alright. Lots of cream. Lots of lots of cream I think when we get back. Start bathing in baby oil and hey, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> um, yeah, no, sort it out. With the flotilla now comprising of seven ribs, plus the two support boats, it's the largest number since the challenge began. With the remains of the 13th century abbey shrouded in mist, conditions on day 7 seem similar to the day before, with the forecast of moderate winds forced 3 to 4 and bright sunshine later on, the ribs head off on their 100 mile passage towards the North Norfolk coast. A few hours in, and there's problems again with Team Ribex's engine. As the other boats stand by, spanners again on hand to try and diagnose the problem. But it doesn't appear to be serious, and the teams are soon on their way. It's a relatively calm sea, but even so, a camera on board Grey Seal shows just how bumpy the ride can be on a four metre boat. With mile upon mile of golden dunes, Wells next the sea is a sandlot port, accessible only at certain states of the tide. It's also the home port of John and Wayne, who've just pulled out of the event but managed to bring their boat home by road in time for a special reception tonight in the town's yacht club. As the RB4 ribs are piloted in, it seems as though the whole town has come out to welcome them. It's one of the high points of the trip so far. Four hundred people have turned out, and some of the teams do appear a little bewildered by the reception at the quayside, wondering if the crowds are there to see someone else. As the boats tie up, teams are overwhelmed by the attention and questions from onlookers.
team Spirit arrive half an hour later. The Yacht Club are hosting a special reception this evening for all our B4 boats. Food, drink and a special awards ceremony has been organised for everyone taking part. Our boat, our local boat, which was Team Aldous, unfortunately isn't made all the way round. Any consolation, John, when, you, uh, when I asked where you were, someone said, well, he hasn't made it, but if anyone deserved to make it, he did, because he's tried yeah. harder than anyone. We've got the land support, which is Joe. With John and Wayne's boat on a trailer outside, Mark goes over to inspect the damage. Both teams have overcome problems that would have retired most boats, and they share the same frustrations at being let down by broken engine parts. But you were, I mean, you worked really hard to gain that time up, didn't you? Yes. I mean, I thought we worked hard, but like we you were, were. We were two days behind and we got it down to three hours before the second one snapped over really? a period of, tw of about 30 hours. 36, 26 hours solid. So how you, I mean, until we, we, when we were you, when you We had pulled in a peat head, we couldn't do no more. We were, the, the sea oh, was so turquoise, we, man. All the guillemots had looked like kingfishers. <laughs> 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 we had to go in. I was going through these tide rips, man. I should have been five miles off. I was just hugging their coast like an idiot. Yeah. And I thought, like, nah, this is getting dangerous, way. Let's pull in, man. We, we wanted to keep going to Barry, but we couldn't. Yeah. We couldn't. What do you think about what John and Wayne have uh, had to I go think, through? I think they've got a lot, uh, they've got a lot of good ideas. Um, yeah, inventive. Yeah, very inventive. Um, it's just bad luck. You know, they put so much into it to, to come out of it, you know. The way they did it, it just, it was just bad luck. They put a lot of thought in, and uh, these guys aren't going to go away. They're going to be back. They're they're going to be back big time. Day eight, and it's an 8:30 a.m. start for Team Spirit as they run on ahead of the rest of the fleet in calm but foggy conditions. Their new engines running smoothly, and with a cruising speed of 27 knots, they should get into Ramsgate by mid-afternoon. Today's leg is 140 miles, a relatively short run in comparison to previous passages. Wells next the sea is situated on the North Norfolk coast. From there, the boats head east, past the sandbanks, and then south, passing Lowestoft, Felixstowe, and across the Thames estuary to Ramsgate. It's a straightforward route. The only challenge is to avoid the large numbers of lobster pot markers that seem to be scattered everywhere. The rest of the ribs follow, although engine problems on board the support boat delay them by an hour. As the mist gives way to bright sunshine, Spirit arrives at Ramsgate. It's three o'clock, and the first time since the challenge began that they've arrived ahead of the fleet. For the third day the weather has smiled at them, but with a southwesterly gale forecast in the next 24 hours, the team realised that there's another 280 miles to run before they're home and dry. Because of danger of becoming too complacent, and I don't think you can ever do that with the sea. Uh, I, th I really do want to make sure that we're as prepared on the last two legs as we were for the first two legs. We've had a lot of breakages. Uh, we've got a lot of batteries that are going down low that need to be recharged. That's right. A lot of things need to be lashed, and it'll just give us the time to do that so the boat will be able to take whatever sea we find going down the, uh, going down the western approaches toward Plymouth. Because I think, although it's our home stretch of water, we know it very well, and it could, it could be perfect conditions, but then again, it could be a howling gale. The forecast doesn't look good, does it, from the last day? I believe not, no. no. So we, we can't get complacent. No. We've got to prepare for it. That's right. And Mark has really driven us all hard. And a I bit too my, hard sometimes. I take my hat off to Mark. He, he's, he's been the motivation behind the team. He's been the one who's made us do the stuff that well, some of the guys didn't want to do. Um, 
and it's really come good at the end. So, yeah. Well done, mate. Thanks, chap. At just after 5 pm, the rest of the fleet arrive. <laughs> There's few repairs required to the boats today, and everyone's on a high. Yeah. Very, very good, very easy, and um, just what we needed to recuperate, because um, it wasn't windy, the sea was flat, it didn't rain, just pretty much a straight line navigation. So I actually feel a little refreshed, get a good meal inside me tonight. Maybe a jar or two and then uh, early to bed, ready for the penultimate leg. Yeah, it was good though. It's good. So westerly gale. When? Sunday. Okay. It's going to be right on the nose all the way. Well, to be fair, we've had a few predictions of different weather that hasn't come true. Today there's supposed to be quite a bit of wind and there's nothing, so we'll just wait until Sunday morning and then we'll know better. I'm, I'm desperate, desperate to get home, but so want to finish this. So I, I, want, I don't want to get in a car and drive home. I want to finish this, but I really want to get home now. It's a Friday night, and all our B4 teams have arranged to meet up at a Quayside restaurant. The team settled down to a long session of food and drink, although at the back of everyone's mind is the thought of the low pressure system steadily closing in from the southwest. Later that night, a few dare to venture out to sample Ramsgate's nightlife. They may be some of the oldest swingers in town, but it doesn't stop them partying till dawn. There's a hen night in the club, and Toby can't resist the temptation to sweep the bride-to-be off her feet. In contrast to last night, it's a damp, gloomy start to day nine. The weather conditions forecast for today is light winds at first and I think they're going, to, they're going to gradually strengthen later on in the day. So we're going to make an early start and uh, hopefully run into Southampton. Uh, we might be pushing a bit of a tide. Uh, if we are, we could hold up somewhere and wait for the tide to change because we've got plenty of time. Interesting day ahead, I think, because we could have a situation where we get to Southampton and we have to make a decision as to whether we're going to push on through the night in good weather or hold on to the day, the following day, and, and go in bad weather. So we're just we're just within striking distance now. Um, but still a couple of tough days, I think, ahead. I hope the weather stays like it is, or like it was yesterday, because it wouldn't be nice if it blows up. I, I have no idea what the forecast is either. <laughs> Very well well prepared, I am. But yeah, I'm feeling really good. Quite glad that this is like one of the last legs, actually. Looking forward to going home. Looking forward to sleeping in for 12 hours and not have to wake up at the crack of dawn. With some of last night's revellers keeping a low profile, rib veteran Paul Lemmer's on hand to keep everyone in good humour. I didn't only provide you with money last night, I've got to provide the whole team oh, with money. Yes. Money I owe you, 50 oh, pounds. Oh, how that? Fancy I remembering that. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, those moths. <laughs> Bats flew out of that wallet last time it was open. His family is all, all one of the Quakers, you know. They quake every time they open their wallets. <laughs> At 10 o'clock, the fleet set off. The good news is that the predicted southwesterlies are lighter than expected, and the ribs make good progress. Boats pass through the Strait of Dover at a comfortable 18 to 20 knots, with the distinctive white cliffs looming in the distance.
but it's a 140 mile run to Southampton which gives plenty of time for the conditions to deteriorate. And as expected, a few hours later the winds increase and large wave formations begin to build. It's a grim few hours as the boats push on through the rain, taking quite a pounding in the head seas. As the ribs veer west, the conditions take a turn for the worse. Passing Dungeness, they encounter large breaking seas confounded by poor visibility. Things don't improve when they pick up a radio transmission from a black Ministry of Defence vessel in the distance. The ribs are about to steam into a live firing range, and now have to steer south to avoid any friendly fire. Boats pass Eastbourne and Brighton, but the conditions are steadily worsening. The short, steep, choppy seas are the rib's worst enemy. It's a struggle to keep the boats on the plane, as hulls launch into the air, then crash down again, reducing cruising speeds to 12 knots. battle on for hour upon hour, eventually arriving at Southampton just after 7pm. It's day 10, the last day of the challenge, and at 5.30am, the earliest wake-up call so far for the teams. Bit of a lumpy ride yesterday, wasn't it? It was extremely bumpy. It wasn't pleasant. And it looks like today isn't going to be any better. It still seems to be on the nose, so... Another 130 miles of hell. <laughs> Glad you had a good day, here. The coffee? Toby coffee. Oh, mate. Yeah, and then we're all set. It says I think this weather has definitely played the it's not over to the fat lady sings one. Four to five start off dropping off during the course of the day. We get progressively better so we move on and crack on, which wouldn't be too bad. Crack be in the upper of word. Maybe crack wasn't a good choice of words. <laughs> Press on. We lost we had some. Press on expecting things to improve as time goes ahead. Everyone's exhausted after nine days at sea, but motivated by the thought that tonight, one way or another, it'll all be over. Today's journey's not going to be nice. Yesterday's was horrible. <laughs> so yes, I'm, looking, I'm quite glad. Looking forward to ending, going home. I'm going to sleep for hours and hours and hours and hours. Being looked after. <laughs> it's not very comfortable when you've got short, uh, big seas on your nose. No, not at all. You just flying through the chop and just slamming back down again for hours on end. No, it's not, you need to stand up really, but it's hard to stand up in that little yeah. grey boat. Just have to sit there and just, just smash down each wave. Yeah, I don't know what, I, no idea what conditions are. I think it's going to be a bit better today. I think we've got northerly wind and we're going with the tide. So wind's almost behind us-ish, sort of. But be a little bit more pleasant, I think. We're going to hug the land anyway to keep sheltered. Um, feeling a bit battered today after yesterday, but um, today's the last leg, and uh, I just can't wait to get home. So the only thing that's going to get me through the day is knowing that um, we're going to be home today, and, and that um, I'm going to see Debbie later on. So that, that's that's the goal, and to know that we finished the challenge. That'd be great. 
but uh, it was hard yesterday, battered. I felt very tired yesterday. For the first time I felt, apart from the first day out to Milford Haven, I felt very, um, very beaten up by the ride. But uh, I think that was just because it was straight on the nose again. Very short, very short and steep for a couple of hours, which is very taxing, very draining. And it's five o'clock, and it's a Sunday morning. And um, I don't think I need a third, do I? It's taken its toll, hasn't it, on people's faces and their skin? What are you trying to say? Not really. <laughs> 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 trying to say I look horrendously atrocious now with my skin falling apart. I think I've left a piece of my face in every port. <laughs> it keeps falling off. Yeah, or, or um, Steve. Yeah. Oh, God, that's a bit too much now, isn't it, really? It's a bit over the top, really, this, isn't it? Despite the prospect of Force 5 conditions, it's a satisfying feeling as the ribs leave Southampton, knowing there's only 140 miles to run to Plymouth. ribs run close to the shore as they pass the Purbeck Hills in Dorset. Sadly, the schedule doesn't allow for any sightseeing, which is a pity as the teams pass some of Britain's most spectacular coastline. The final leg sees the ribs emerging from the Solent and travelling west past Portland Bill and hugging the Lime Bay coastline before rounding start point and making the final push back to Plymouth. It's been arranged for all ribs to congregate a few miles outside Plymouth in order to run into port in a group. With the emphasis being that this is a challenge, not a race, the plan is to arrive back as a team and cross the finishing line together. It's 5pm as the ribs prepare for the last few miles. All but two of the boats have made it around the British Isles, covering 1,700 miles in 10 days, the first time ever for a fleet of four metre boats. With the end in sight, the thrill of completing the challenge begins to build. Boats roar into Plymouth Sound with whistles and horns blazing. It's a high-spirited end to an event that no one taking part will ever forget. Well done, you did so well. Who's your water type? I don't know yet. Are you in? Well done. Yeah, well done. Fantastic. Well done. <laughs> now you're going to sing. Steve is finally reunited with his fiancée Debbie, whom he'll be marrying in six days' time. Well done. I got picked up and thrown in. now? Yeah, about three times. <laughs> How's it going to be back? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> That's a word of the week. <laughs> Fab fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Nice to get, be on dry land. Uh, Fantastic. Good to be back. How was it? So good, so good. Great to have done it, great to have done it, but so good to be back. Oh, what a rush coming in, my goodness, the adrenaline. It's fantastic, fantastic, really good. So pleased I did it, loved it, loved it, it was great.
but never do it again. <laughs> never do it again. I couldn't. Oh boy. Did you miss him, Debbie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we really did. Yeah, yeah, we really did. But it's good, really good thing to do. Home now. Yeah, home. What are you doing Saturday? <laughs> Wanna get married? Oh, I've got a date with this guy. <laughs> oh, awesome experience, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Worth every pound of petrol that we spend. It's been tiring, it's been emotional. Yeah. It's been <coughs> Would we go again? Oh, yeah, only, it's only with us. Yeah, it would. <laughs> go with a bigger boat. <laughs> yeah. With a cabin on it. Next year we're doing it in a, a three metre rib. Yeah, three. <laughs> You reckon? A three metre rib with a 15 on the back. <laughs> the antics continue on the pontoon, with Joe and Jan receiving their customary dunkings, much to everyone else's amusement. Straight in the bar for Jan. Yep. Well, I did get some money actually. I was going to buy a round. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people said it couldn't be done, some people said it shouldn't be done, but uh, judging by the happy faces of everybody standing here today and the success of it all and the safe manner in which it's been achieved, well I, I'm, I'm just simply delighted, just simply delighted, everybody has done so well, they really have, it's been excellent, it's all it's been all about overcoming problems and challenges and difficulties and when people reach their lowest ebb, battling on, sometimes at three o'clock in the morning in the dark when they're cold, hungry, wet and uh, the destination is a long way off. They've kept going and that's why they're here today. Move in a bit. <laughs> Luck, judgment, favourable weather, call it what you will, the RB4 teams have had it all, pushing the boundaries of what's achievable in these four-wheel drives of the sea.